opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Firstly, I would like to thank the British people for turning out to vote in the referendum in such high numbers. The vote was a reflection of the significance of the issue, but it was a close vote on the back of a campaign that was, too often, divisive and negative. These benches put forward a positive case to remain part of the European Union and convinced more than two-thirds of our own supporters. But the majority of people have voted to leave, and we have listened to and accepted what they've said. Many people feel disenfranchised and powerless, especially in parts of the country that have been left behind for far too long. Communities, Mr Speaker, that have been let down, not by the European Union, but by Tory governments. Those communities don't trust politicians to deliver because for too long they haven't. So, instead of more extreme cuts to local services, which have hit the areas the hardest, this Government needs to invest in those communities. Many of those areas are deeply concerned, deeply concerned about the security of pledged EU funding. Can the Prime Minister give us any guarantees on those issues as that money is desperately needed. Secondly, it's the issue of trust, and the tenor in the referendum campaign was disheartening. Half-truths and untruths were told, many of which key Leave figures spent the weekend distancing themselves from, not least the claim that the vote to leave the Leave would hand the NHS an extra £350 million per week. It is quite shameful that politicians made claims they knew to be false and promises they knew could not be delivered. Thirdly, real concern exists about immigration, but too much of the discussion in the referendum campaign was intemperate and divisive. And in the days following the referendum result, it appears we have seen a rise in racist incidents, such as the attack on the Polish centre in Hammersmith, which the Prime Minister quite rightly referred to, and sadly, many other such incidents all over this country. I hope the Prime Minister and Home Secretary will take all action they can to halt these attacks, halt this disgraceful racist behaviour on the streets of this country. As political leaders, we have a duty to calm our language and our tone, especially after the shocking events of ten days ago. Our country is divided, and the country will thank neither the benches in front of me nor those behind for indulging in internal factioning manoeuvring at this time. We have Mr Speaker, we have Mr. Speaker, we have serious matters to discuss in this House and in the country. And I want to accommodate as many as possible of those colleagues who wish to question the Prime Minister. Matters are just slowed up if people make a lot of noise. I've got plenty of time. I don't know whether other people have. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It does appear that neither wing of the Tory government has an exit plan, which is why we're insisting that the Labour Party be fully engaged in the negotiations that lie ahead. We need the freedom to shape our economy for the future and protect social and employment rights while building new policies on trade, on migration, environmental protection and on investment. I fully understand the Prime Minister is standing down in three months' time but we cannot be in a state of paralysis until then. The Prime Minister is meeting the European Council tomorrow. I hope he's going to say that uh, negotiations will begin so we know what's going on, rather than being delayed until October. We as a House have a duty to act in the national interest and ensure we get the best agreements for our constituents. Will the Prime Minister today confirm that in the light of the economic turmoil, the Chancellor will announce at least a suspension, preferably the termination, of his now even more counterproductive fiscal rule. What the economy needs now is a clear plan 
for investment, particularly in those communities that have been so damaged by this government and sent such a very strong message to all of us last week? Will he specifically rule out tax rises or further cuts to public services that were threatened in the pre-referendum? I welcome his assurances on the uncertainty felt by many EU nationals currently working in our economy, including the 52,000 who work so well and help our National Health Service to provide the service we all need. It is welcome that the Prime Minister is consulting with the leaders of devolved administrations and, I hope, with the Mayor of London too, a city for which the implications are huge. We must act in the public interest and support measures to reduce volatility. I welcome market protections, but what about protections for people's jobs, their wages and their pensions? Can the Prime Minister make clear what plans are in place? The Chancellor spoke this morning to reassure the stock markets, though they clearly remain very uncertain. We understand that some measures cannot be discussed in the House, so will he give me an assurance that the Chancellor will provide private briefing, briefings to his opposite numbers on this matter? <laughs> Finally, Mr Speaker, on a personal note, may I say... May I say, Mr Speaker, finally, on a personal note, I have many fundamental disagreements with the policies of the Prime Minister and his government. Nevertheless, as he announces the end of his Premiership, it's right to reflect that he led a government that delivered equal marriage against the majority of his own MPs, and he was right to do so. I want to thank him, too, for his response to the Bloody Sunday inquiry and how he reacted to the tra tragic murder of Joe Cox. We thank him for his service, although I'm sure we will enjoy many more debates and disagreements while he continues as Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, let me agree with the um, Leader of the Opposition that it was positive turnout was so high. I also agree with him that we do need to reach out to those people who haven't benefited from economic growth and make sure they feel uh, that their economic security is important to us as well. But I don't agree with him that it's right to start to try and refight the campaign uh, all over again. All I know, for my part, is I feel I put everything I could into the campaign that I believed in, head, heart and soul, and I left nothing out, and I'm, I think that was the right thing to do. Answering his questions on money that um, uh, different areas of the country get, uh, until we leave the EU, none of those arrangements change. So what has been set out in the budget and the payments and the rest of it, all of those continue. But as the negotiation begins properly for leaving, obviously the next government will want to set out what arrangements it will put in place for farmers, for local authorities, for regions of our country. On intolerance and fighting intolerance, I absolutely agree with him. We must take all action we can to stamp this out. Uh, he asked about the Chancellor's fiscal rule and also future plans. What I would say is that we have not worked so hard to get the budget deficit from 11% down to below 3% to see that go to waste and we must continue to make sure that we have a sound and strong economic plan in our country. Uh, for the coming months that is my responsibility and the Chancellor's responsibility in time it will be the responsibility of a new government and they will have to decide how to react if, uh, if there are economic difficulties uh, along the way. He asked if there could be private briefings um, for members of the front bench with the Chancellor of the Exchequer as always in these uh, arrangements, if um, shadow cabinet members want those sorts of briefings, uh, they can have them. And can I finally thank him for his um, kind remarks and the fact that he hopes that we'll be debating with each other for some weeks and possibly months to come. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kenneth Clark.